you in, in the class. And then she'll have an interesting story about how she got interested in this. Okay, thanks a lot, Jennifer. And thanks to everybody for coming. And so I've divided my talk into three parts. My motivations, maybe that's the interesting story. My two classes where I tried this out with a lot of help from Jenny and her staff. And then for those of you who are still awake, again, <laughs> and who use Moodle, I'll tell you about my, some of my misadventures and how Jenny periodically came to my rescue. And sometimes not. <laughs> sometimes not. There's some open questions. Okay. <laughs> so I teach biochemistry, and you need to see way too many learning goals. And first of all, for you language faculty, I consider biochemistry to be a language, and therefore you need to speak it, read it, write it, see it, etc. And then we can skip down to the assignments that I'll be talking about. So in using the language, I have two goals that are related to getting students to sort of apply biochemistry to the world outside of them, mostly to health and consumer issues in green, and I have one assignment for that. And then the other class, to get the students onto the next level of looking at the world of research as we transition from a text-based, textbook-based class to uh, the primary literature. Okay, how did I get interested in peer review? Well, I was elected to chair the curriculum committee and people were telling us that you need to get on to this MOOC thing. So I said, okay, I can sign up for a MOOC and I took a course about this time last year. And they, this course on the Affordable Care Act incorporated peer review exclusively. It did not really have multiple choice questions. And what I liked about it was that it had interesting, complicated questions, it had rub rubrics and sample answers. And the best part I thought was reading the other answers from my several peers out of tens of thousands out there. And I also liked that writing quality was always assessed. Now, so I, so I enjoyed this peer review, but there were some downsides or some shortcomings as um, were incorporated into this class. And one of the problems with rubrics were that often the, the questions were complicated, but the answers were really simple. And, and so when this happened, sometimes the peer reviewers said, hey, we're all students. I'm not deducting points from anybody because the answer was dumb. <laughs> and then what I thought was really a problem was that some of the Coursera features were pre-recorded and so when you went to the next week's lecture whenever that was you might have expected them to talk about this revolt amongst the peer reviewers but that didn't happen either so there was this failure to close the loop and they didn't talk about you know what happened in the homework and you know what would have been better answers so so I decided to avoid all of these red things in my own peer review and to do and to allow the students to basically read each other's answers. I thought that was the most important thing. As well as developing all this facility in biochemistry language by reading and writing some. Okay. So in one class, advanced biochemistry that's mostly seniors, the course is really focused on biochemical techniques, but you need a context for that. And the context I chose was HIV AIDS. And so the science students really want to learn about HIV AIDS and society in addition to the science stuff. And so we had several kind of background or context type readings. There were a set of four videos made by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and then last summer, Science came out with the AIDS in America that had 10 short articles. And so I consider that the way the students read and watch these is sort of not a terribly technical, sophisticated biochemical language, but it's sort of high on their personal interest. And so any given student would have watched one video and read one article, and then they were told to write a summary analysis <coughs> And then they were graded on a really 
or their peers reviewed them on a really simple rubric. I didn't want to get any really complicated uh, rubric, so they wrote this pretty short summary and analysis. And then each student in the class read three and assessed it. Okay. And, and so what did I learn about this? And I learned some good things. The students kind of liked this. And they really enjoyed reading what their classrooms had to say. How many, how many students? I had about 20 students in this class. Wow. And how long were these assignments? Just how long were the assignments? How much were they supposed to write? <clears throat> they were supposed to write two paragraphs. So most of them wrote more than I actually told them to. Um, so the, yeah, the students enjoyed reading what their classmates had to say. Some of them enjoyed not having to read all 10 or watch all four. That's the saving time. They liked receiving their peer feedback and they liked seeing a different point of view. Um, in red, they had some improvements for me. Um, they wanted more detail. Um, this grading thing. They didn't really enjoy <laughs> taking points off their colleagues, particularly <laughs> since I didn't have an anonymous the first time. Um, so that was, and so then I think that goes with being hard to be objective. And then they found it hard to assess writing, and they wanted comments. And so with uh, Superperson Jenny's help, I learned how to fix these things. Um, I'll say a little bit more about, about this one. I did not want the students' assessments to be graded per se, other than they did it. Um, Yes, you can make it anonymous. Can we require a comment? I'm getting better at this. I'm getting closer at that one. The students really seem to like the comments rather than one, two, three, or excellent, good, four. OK, second one. And so this was linking a textbook topic to current research and explaining it to peers. So this was kind of sort of cruising from my semi-success, I decided to make life really complicated. <laughs> and so this is a chunk out of my syllabus that for any biochemists out there, you notice a pretty standard organization of topics from a textbook. And the, typically the last section in any given chapter is not something that I'll get to in class, but might be a very current biochemical problem for which there are dozens and dozens of research articles. So the idea was, I wasn't, didn't think ahead far enough on this one. I said, students, you can work in pairs, you can work alone, pick a topic. Um, and so they distributed themselves amongst these topics. And this was the calendar that I made up for them. And this took pretty much most of the time after spring break. So they find a project. And the teammate, I had some sort of way of getting them distributed. Some of you might be saying, hey, this is pretty cool pedagogically because students can revisit chapter two when we're in chapter 14. And, and so that was kind of built into the process of spreading them, them out. So we, we're not just forgetting what we learned about protein folding all the way through. Um, so we sign up for a project. They wrote proposals, which were kind of a two paragraph, something about the textbook part and something about the article that they found. I commented on this and gave it a pretty low stakes grade, you can see. So I'm not completely abdicating my responsibility here, no matter what my students seem to think <laughs> by the end. Um, and then students had time to do a draft of the paper. And I'll, I'll be showing you the rubric, okay? And they posted this on Moodle. And then the idea was that their peer reviewers would be commenting on the drafts. And I did have a brief moment of professorial triumph when the inevitable student came up to me and kind of said, well, you know, this is midterm time. I'm really kind of busy, so my draft is going to be really kind of drafty because the final thing is not due until April something, April 30th, week before the end of the semester, and you'll get my final draft by then, but this thing that's due on this day, it's going to be really kind of drafty. And I'm thinking, oh no, here I've got to give the speech about, you know, give it your best shot, I know you're busy. 
and a student stepped up and said, well, the more you've written and the better it is, the better feedback you'll be getting from your peers. And I just kind of stepped back and <laughs> wasn't there and let the students discuss. And everybody gave me a pretty decent draft. So that was good because I tried having students do draft before and sometimes you don't get very complete drafts. And of course, this was not very many points. So then the fun started. <laughs> Each student peer reviews three papers on Moodle. Now I had some students working as individuals. This worked out fine. Some groups working as pairs. Moodle kind of had a nervous breakdown, which we'll get to. <laughs> okay, so students did enjoy reading and commenting on these. And then finally students turned in their papers. And then interspersed with this, I'm giving students little talks about how life is in the scientific real world. You know, you frequently give a talk on unfinished work at a conference. Yes, this is normal. Give a presentation that will inform your writing, you know? And so they were okay with giving a presentation before they were exactly finished. That was okay. I also gave them a little talk on how my postdoctoral professor said, here, Susan, here are the peer reviews. Read them and go take a walk around the block before you have a nervous breakdown or whatever. There will be comments you like and can use. There will, there will be comments you don't like that will be stupid. And there will be comments that you don't like that are actually helpful. You know, so I tried to head this off at, at the past. And that was actually sort of successful. OK, so what I did have a rubric. And again, I didn't want it to be terribly elaborate. I wanted to learn from Coursera. And so I was trying to stress the connection between the textbook and how you start things off and how you're addressing <laughs> the biochemical problem. So does the first paragraph explain the biochemical problem to be addressed with appropriate background using textbook level concepts? And you can see you have a wide range of choices on how you want to set these things up in Moodle. Um, this was a three grade something or other with a comment allowed but not required. And this is kind of a typical level of, of a comment. And I would say, you know, I should hire some of these students to write comments. <laughs> so that was one. And there are five questions total. I didn't want this to be terribly burdensome. I did want there to be a clear connection between the textbook level introduction and the article. So that was, uh, that was talked about. I did want the students to include figures from the article and explain them. And, and then we continue and I, you know, commenting on writing and I think particularly when it's peers reviewing their colleagues, they're the best ones to judge whether it makes sense or not. And then finally something about references, which was the most controversial. I just tell the students, pick your favorite chemistry or biochemistry um, journal and write references accordingly. The class was tremendously split. I like footnotes. I like this. I'm going to shut up. That's not important. <laughs> Just be consistent. OK, student comments. Again, I just got these evaluations. What did they write? Well, they were mostly positive. Um, they liked learning about the other kinds of topics that they weren't personally responsible from. Um, they did admit that they learned from the peer review, even if they didn't always agree from the comments. They did say that it was helpful in writing the final paper, and that was the whole idea. And they said it was good to get familiar from people who were not intimately familiar with that one journal article. And it did, they said, particularly um, in preparing the presentation, it forced them to work with their partner. Um, the red ones were the kind of negative comments or things for you to think about. Um, some students, we did have some Moodle problems that I'll explain in a second, said, to heck with Moodle. Let me go back 10 or 15 years, print out a hard copy, and you know, exchange papers. I have done that in the past. I think I could way, think of a way to make it robust, but it probably wouldn't be as robust as this. I wouldn't really know what's happening so much. Some people said they didn't learn from peer review. And I think that from the tenor of a few of these comments, it's like we needed professor comments in order to change anything. Um, and again, some 
some people wanted like more comments, so they thought doing fewer peer reviews, but I think that would defeat the purpose of having them read several of these. Um, and then of course there were some comments not helpful. This this little balloon is to remind me to say um, there, I think that there are online ways to do a more of an annotation word by word thing. And I don't know if that would be worthwhile for the sort of reading about your colleagues' work, but not being a line editor. That's not the purpose here. Okay, what did I take home from this? First lesson along the lines of what we heard this morning was students, you know, you sort of put this out here and you hold your breath because you do not want students beating each other over the head, particularly in those hours between midnight and 4 a.m. when I'm asleep. Um, <laughs> students can write respectful, helpful comments, so that's good. They do enjoy sharing. They do enjoy the independentness of the project. Um, I don't know how concerned I am that the comments might say, hey, pay attention to this, pay attention to that, this doesn't make sense. But the score is whatever the highest thing is. Um, from my point of view, despite the peer reviews, you know, students get told, hey, you don't have any transition from paragraph one to paragraph two. That same flaw may show up in the final draft. But, you know, this doesn't come to, this should not be a surprise to anybody who's trying to help students write. This is common. You know, they don't pay attention to my comments, so why would they change, why would they pay attention to their peers' comments? Um, I, and you may have noticed that my calendar was a little bit tight, and so I personally did, was not able to return all of this work to the students in a timely fashion. Now, we did have a slightly exciting spring around here, so there may have been some extenuating uh, circumstances. Um, and I, I used the same grading rubric as the one that I gave to the students, and that actually helped me grade faster, but I wasn't quite fast enough. So I think I need to make a more compressed calendar or have things done due earlier. Okay, this is the Moodle madness. So if you don't do Moodle or if you're a Moodle expert, you can just kind of rest. Setting up the Moodle workshop is a little bit daunting. <laughs> No, maybe friends don't let friends do this alone. <laughs> um, so if you are a Moodle person, Moodle has two general kinds of options. There's a sort of uploading things and then there's the activities thing. This is like the bottom one under activities. And you can see lots of things make sense, like what kind of grade is your assessment, what the grade for submission. There are a bunch of strategies for this how do you want to grade? A cumulative was that sort of question that you score with a comment. Uh, there are some no grading options that may be better at soliciting only comments. Um, so I selected five. I had five questions. I, um, you know, a bunch of these are self-explanatory. Where I kind of fell down, and you'll see it in a moment here is I've been steadily decreasing this comparison of assessments. As far as I can figure, in the Moodle world, the ideal class would come to a consensus about every peer review thing. And you can have iterative peer reviews. I'm not interested in that. I don't even care so much that all of the peer assessments agree. I don't want them to be random, but I'm not really going to control by that. Um, so one of the assessments, that was three. Um, there's some fancy stuff down here that I'm not going to talk about. Yeah, this, this one is kind of important, the anonymous one, at least for <laughs> my students. I did not have a self-assessment, and I did not have a teacher assessment. Some of the students would have wanted that. Okay. So, are there any? Well, I hope there's no students here. <laughs> it really matter. So Moodle, this you can look at this two ways. This might be way too much data, or this is data that you do not have to kind of collect yourself if you do the kind of hard copy thing. So there's a bunch of numbers over here that grade assessments, and then there's a number of grades here that are the numbers that the assessors graded. As as I said before, 
I don't really care. All I do is count. Yeah, they did three, they did three. They got full credit for doing the assessments. And um, <coughs> okay, so you get lots and lots of numbers here and you can check up. You can check up on these. Um, the real part where I got into trouble here is, okay, you have due dates and I had that compressed calendar and then of course there's one student that submit late and then I had to change the due dates and then I had overlapping submission and assessment. I do not really know if that caused any difficulties. But especially if you have a small class and people are starting to assess before everybody has submitted, um, that's kind of a drag. And the real issue, this uh, hazard sign, is I was putting students into groups because some of them were working as individuals and some as pairs, and that created all kinds of issues. Um, so I would probably either get re-educated or not do that option, just have individuals do it. And then kind of surprisingly, once this process starts, there doesn't seem to be any kind of manual override in assigning assessments. I don't know, there's some complete black box <laughs> way that these assignments are doled out to students for peer reviewing. And so if you wanted some balancing of topics or something like that, there just doesn't seem to be any way if a student whines in the middle of the night, oh, well, I don't have anything to assess because you screwed up the group settings. You know, you can't just quickly dole out three things to, to assess. And so that did create some, uh, some stress, which is why some of my students said, oh, just do it paper and pencil. Mm -hmm. And so that's pretty much it. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah. <laughs> Um, did, the, did the students you reviewers get to see your assessment of the uh, pieces that they were reviewing? But did they get to see your assessment of the, of the pieces that they themselves had reviewed? Well, I did not assess them except at the very end when they turned in the final draft. So, so, they so, so no. At the draft stage, I wrote comments and I assigned very kind of low stakes grades. But no. And I think... You know, I really wanted the students to get advice from their peers, so I tried to stay out of it. And clearly, students are in different places with respect to whether they want to take advice from their peers or advice from a faculty member. And then, of course, it's sort of anonymous as well. Yeah. And was it double blind? In other words, did the students know whose pieces they were reviewing? Um, many of the students wrote their names on the thing, so yes. And of course, they sort of knew who signed up for which project. And in a class of 18, they would probably know anyhow. Yeah. Was there a value in um, making the students assign numbers to the things they were peer reviewing, or was, that, was the value primarily the comments? If you were to do it again, would you have assigned numbers? Yeah. I I'm not sure I would have them assign numbers. They seem to value the comments more. And given the disagreement between the numbers and the comments, maybe I would just go with comments. So that, that is a not graded. There's quite a number of grading options. So that's the not graded option. But then some students didn't really give a whole lot of comments. Yeah. Am I understanding you correctly that Moodle Workshop is somehow designed to do exactly what you did? In other words, it, it distributes? Uh, right. Yeah. Exactly what they were thinking, I don't know. That would sort of help me in figuring this out because I think the Moodle Workshop activity puts a lot of stock in having people re-review stuff until the grades agree, which to me that just seems like a lot of work. I mean, does it allow? <coughs> For multiple rounds? Oh. I, yeah, I, th I think so. I didn't go there. You know, my that Superman can help me here. <laughs> this this um, assessment must be agreed, which is right. uh, four up from the bottom. With that one, um, it's assessed. The assessment goes to the student who submitted the work. They get to comment on it. Then it goes back to the assessor. The assessor comments, and it goes back and forth until they, they agree. So you can do it that way. <laughs> 
there's a and and the high grades before agreement means that all of that discussion is happening before the person who's being assessed knows what how they've been scored. Um, another thing that it can do apparently too, and I think more recent versions of Moodle, you can actually do a manual override. Um, so that is coming down the pipe, or if you already. Can, can I distribute the things myself? Is that manual? Well, that would be nice. Mm -hmm. And then there's this, Jen talked a little bit about the lead table of submitted, submitted work. If you had 10,000 people in your class and you wanted to see the best, could the students mm -hmm. see the best? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, that's what it's up to do. To put however many, the number that you choose there would be the number, the top, you know, 10 or 5 or whatever. Um, like the names of them or the actual? The actual piece. submission, I think. I, I know it's the, the name, and it, yeah, I'm not sure about that. We're going to do a lot of testing on this. One of the things that we discovered is, um, so all of these different options, when you then select other options, right, it creates this sort of crazy um, degree of, you can really get it to do a lot of the things that you might want it to do, but that means that the complexity is just overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So we're also going to maybe come up with some recipes for common, you know, um, things that you might want to do with this so you don't have to go through all of the complexity. Yeah. I also found that for something complicated like this, the student view is, it doesn't give you enough information. So mm -hmm. you're not, you can't really see, particularly when you put students in groups, you can ask for the student view, but you're not any particular student in a group, mm -hmm. so you can't see mm -hmm. anything. Right. She means when you're the instructor viewing as a student, you're viewing as a generic student, which isn't so helpful. For troubleshooting, especially. <laughs> yeah. Um, Jennifer, you, yeah. you mentioned uh, thinking of webinars. Uh huh. Would you? Um, Moodle workshop webinar. Doing something like that? Yeah, definitely. That would be definitely. Yeah. Was there another question? I just was going to make a quick comment um, on the scaling issue. Um, you know, on the scoring, the the the, the for the good where you said the comments didn't always match the score that the students gave each other. And I, I think um, you've got in your head what you think is what good means and what good right. means or what excellent means, and maybe just having a definition right. so mm -hmm. that it won't mm -hmm. completely eliminate that. But I found that in some of the workshops right. that I've had to run that if I don't say specifically, like, you know, like detailed clarity, no doubt about blah, 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 then people kind of get it. But otherwise, everybody's right. defining good on their own terms. Right. And one of the grading strategies is rubric where you write okay. explicitly your own rubric. So yeah, I could have improved Thank you. with that. Thank you. Is workshop a, a part of Moodle or is that an add-on? It's part of Moodle. It it's is. one of the yeah main activities. Yeah. Are you going to continue with this? As long as Jenny's here, I'll continue. <laughs> <laughs> no, because it was worth it from your point of view. It was, yeah, it was worth it. I, I have a much, I have a ton of double class next fall, so I'd like to continue, but I don't know how to deal with 40 students, so <coughs> we'll need to talk about groups or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, David? Kind of a question for Jenny. Can you extract? I'm trying to figure out ways of using this in a way that would let me use it as exemplars for students, just to say these are really good, these are really poor, mm -hmm. and I'm wanting to do that from year to year. It's not been clear to me in Moodle what happens five years from now, right? right. Uh, and and um, God help us if we go to Canvas or we go to something else, you know. <laughs> right, right. Um, um, could you comment a little bit on that? Yeah, I mean, you can archive these things. Um, in practice, I think that works best when you're trying to get like the assignment itself and not all of the student data, although you can you can um, pick that back up. But one of the things that this does have is, um, I'm trying to remember where this is, you can have students, do, 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 go down, go down, uh, back where you were, sorry. Oh, I guess there it is. <laughs> Uh, number of assessment of examples from teachers. So what that allows you to do is put things up that you want the students to look at, and they actually do that in between submitting and the assessment phase, which is kind of dumb. I think they should do it before the submitting phase, but what, what have you. Um, so one of the things you could do is just save out those things and then put them up as examples. Um, and kind of give them a sense of how, you know, how I graded it, how you graded it, that kind of thing. Got it. Yeah. 
Does the data here pipe into the gradebook? It pipes into Google gradebook. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> but I think it's just the final, <coughs> those final scores. Yeah. Or yeah, and I tend not to use the Moodle yeah. gradebook. Yeah. It's more Moodle Madness. Yeah. It's more Moodle Madness. <laughs> Very much so.